in the last video we talked about quotient groups and i think this is a good time that i introduce the notion of a homomorphism so consider any function that sends um that sends you from a certain group g to another group h so you are thinking of a function psi that sends you from g to h uh this function is called a homomorphism uh if uh for all g1 g2 or let's just say xy so for all xy in g uh what happens is that uh psi of xy is equal to psi of x uh times psi of y so if this uh, rule holds for all xy and g uh in that case uh this map is called a homomorphism so uh it's supposed to be a surjective function uh and it may not be uh injective so so what could happen is um is you could have multiple elements getting mapped to the same thing and one example that we saw uh was the quotient group so uh just to recap a quotient group is basically just a set of all cosets of a normal subgroup so if n is a normal subgroup in g in that case the quotient g by n is just a group um uh, with the set of cosets uh which which is just uh, g times n for g in g uh with the operation of multiplication and we define how uh these cosets multiply uh in the in the last video and so we can define a homomorphism for this um so what we can do is say you have all the elements of g over here you take all the elements that are in one particular coset and then map them to some representative like this uh and that representative is just you know some something that represents the coset so i'm just going to write it as uh i don't know g times n itself right so g1 times n and then all of these get mapped to something else so this is representing the coset g to n and so on and so like you can just think of the cosets themselves as the elements as well like that's not an issue and so just keep doing that and uh so note that um this is an homomorphism because say you have two elements x y uh which are so uh, so which are in let's say cosets uh g1 n and g2 n right so if it, if x is in g1 n and y is in g to n in that case x times y that um is actually going to be in g1 g to n why does that happen because you can write x as uh g1 n1 for some n1 in capital n and y as g to n2 and then when you try to multiply them it's g1 n1 uh g to n2 uh but then you can rewrite this as g1 n1 g2 n uh and one inverse uh yeah okay i shouldn't do that i wonder if it's okay to be doing this i don't think it is is it uh yeah so so we just um okay never mind uh i'm just going to use the property of uh, a normal subgroup is that for any element and in uh in you know g what's going to happen is that in in n what's going to happen is that for all uh elements in g you have this thing um g inverse n g is in n which is the same as saying that g inverse n g is equal to some element n2 in n which means that um n g can be written as uh can be written as g times n2 for some element right or you can think of it the opposite way as well uh, that is that gn can be written as uh you know n2 times g right but we're going to use the first one so so over here you can see it's something of the form ng right uh, so you can rewrite this whole thing as g2 times some other element in the normal subgroup so g2 times let's say n3 okay So n3 times n2 is once again just something that's in the normal subgroup because of the closure property, and so it just becomes something n4. And so essentially x y is of the form g1 g2 times something in the normal subgroup. 
um, what that means is that x y is in the coset g1 uh, g2 n right so so the property that um, so this property essentially tells us that psi of x times psi of y which uh, just happens to be g1 n times g2 n that's the same thing as psi of xy because xy is in the coset g1 g2 n right and so this is a homomorphism um yeah obviously these both of these are just groups uh yeah and so that's how we define um so with respect to homomorphism there are some terms uh, which i think are good to know uh, the first term is called the kernel of the homomorphism which is uh, basically the set of all elements so if if psi is going from some g to h basically uh, then the kernel of the homomorphism is basically all elements in g such that they get mapped to the identity uh, of h right so notice that this um, this is a group first of all because if you have so so there there's closure in this thing because for any two elements g1 g2 uh, in in the kernel what's going to happen is that psi of uh so psi of their multiplication g1 g2 that is just psi of g1 times uh, psi of g2 which happens to be the identity of h times identity of h which is just the identity of h right so that means that g1 g2 gets mapped to the identity as well which is the same thing as saying that g1 g2 is in the kernel so there's closure uh there are inverses obviously uh, so first th firstly there's an identity because uh so because of the way that homomorphisms work is that psi of g can be thought of as psi of g times e which is just psi of g times psi of e so clearly psi of e has to be uh has to be e h right because psi of g may not necessarily be or you know whatever we don't even care what this thing is actually we can just take it inverse because it's in a group right so um so yeah uh, the identity of g gets mapped to the identity of h uh, so that means that e is in the kernel right and so the kernel contains the identity element so there's closure there's an identity and there's also inverses so psi of e we know this is just going to be e h but you can write e as psi of g times g inverse for any uh, any so for all g in uh, the kernel right and g inverse may or may not in, be in the kernel but g is right and so uh, because of the way this works um because g inverse is still in capital g right and so you can still apply psi on that and then you can do this homomorphism thing and then say that oh it's just psi of g times psi of g inverse right but we know that this thing is just going to be e sub h uh, e sub h uh, so what this means is that psi of uh, g um uh, i shouldn't say it like that. i don't know um yeah so so the inverses are how do i even say this thing yeah okay so so if g is in the kernel in that case psi of g is just the e sub h thing but then what this means is that psi of g inverse is also e sub h because e sub h times some element from uh from the h group that's just psi of g inverse and that's equal to e sub h from here and so psi of g inverse is e sub h which means that g inverse is uh in the kernel and so we have proved that it's a it's a subgroup of uh g basically we can also show that it's a normal subgroup so once again a normal subgroup is something such that for all small g in capital g if you have k in uh k in the kernel what's going to happen is that g inverse k g that's just that's just going to be equal to k uh not equal to k more like it's just going to belong to the kernel right if it's equal then that's a uh, centralized or something but never mind all that so it's just be belonging to the kernel that's the way a normal subgroup is defined right so if kernel is normal then this uh is going to happen and it's easy to see because um 
because well psi of g inverse k g that's just psi of g inverse uh, times psi of k and then psi of g but then what's psi of k psi of k is just the identity in the uh, in the group h so this thing is just psi of g inverse times psi of g right and this is because k is in the kernel and the way the kernel is defined and so this just becomes psi of uh, g inverse g because of the homomorphism uh, rule and this just becomes psi of e but that's just e h and so what this means is that psi of g inverse k g is e h and so g inverse k g must be in the kernel uh yeah so so that means that the kernel is a normal subgroup of g all right cool uh yeah and so uh so since firstly it's a subgroup uh, which means that uh the group g is just made up of a bunch of cosets of this right now now for any coset uh, g kernel of psi uh, which is obviously something in g uh if if you want to find the the image of this whole coset um up, up, upon applying the homomorphism which i am going to very informally write as psi of g kernel of phi. this is not something that you should be doing you should be using a proper set notation something like something like this thing the you know psi of x thing for such that x is in g kernel of phi whatever but yeah uh, so i'm just going to write that as psi of g kernel phi sorry kernel psi um informally and so this thing is basically just going to be like there's only one element in this set essentially and it's just it's just a uh, g right and that's assuming that g is not already in the kernel because if it is there it's just the identity or something uh, but yeah so and g is also the representative element cool uh, sorry it's not g it's supposed to be psi of g yes because obviously it's the mapping so yeah uh, and that's easy to see because for for any x in g kernel of psi you can write it as uh, g times k where k is in kernel right but then by the homomorphism rule you can write it as psi so the psi of this thing uh you can write that as psi of g times psi of k but psi of k is just the identity so it's just psi of g essentially so everywhere is just a psi of g and so the whole coset uh g kernel psi all the elements in them in it like all of them get mapped to just uh to just psi of g right uh so if i to draw a picture for this then it would be something like this that you have this homomorphism psi which is taking stuff from capital g to something in capital h right uh the kernel is just so this is just the kernel this is getting mapped uh to the identity like all the elements in them are just basically get, getting mapped to identity <coughs> sorry uh any so any uh, other coset like g kernel of psi that gets mapped uh so all of the elements in it get mapped to psi of g right so obviously if psi of g is the identity then this is the same thing as that coset so like yeah but this happens uh yes and we know that uh the kernel is essentially it's uh i don't know how to say this thing so okay so so just think of um all the images of of all the elements uh, in g right so just think about what does get what does g essentially get mapped to just think of that set so let's call that as the image of uh, psi right and that's going to be a subgroup of h so we want to first of all show that it's a group and we can do that uh, by you know uh, basically the subgroup test so for any x y in in the image of psi uh, xy inverse is also going to be in the image of psi right so xy inverse is like well defined it's just a operation in the h group uh, but you can write x and y as something like psi of a and psi of b where a b are in uh, are in the group g right uh, so that's what xy is equal to uh, 
So, so then x y inverse is just psi of a and then psi of b inverse. But we kind of know what the uh, so psi of b inverse is in h obviously um, yeah and we know that this thing is just going to be the same as uh, psi of b inverse right and that's because uh, psi of b times psi of b inverse is just you know psi of the identity which is just the eh thing so that means that psi of b inverse is just the inverse of psi of b right so this is psi of b inverse okay and also there's this psi of uh, a over there and so this just becomes psi of a b inverse and so a b inverse is just something in the group g right so this is actually in the image and so with the subgroup test it's easy to see that this is actually a subgroup of h and uh, oh I, I kind of remember i said at the very start you have a surjectivity thing that's uh, that's not correct that's not correct um, because obviously the image could potentially be a proper subgroup of H. But in any case, what's happening is the whole G thing gets mapped to a subgroup image of uh, Psi. And then these cosets individually get mapped uh, to individual elements in that image, in, in that uh, subgroup. Right. Um, so, so you can write that. So, so since the uh, since since cosets are getting mapped to uh, individual elements essentially and it's a homomorphism that is to say that if you had coset 1 and coset 2 then psi of the multiplication of that that's the same thing as saying the psi of multiple psi of c1 multiplied by psi of c2 and yes once again i'm just using the sloppy notation of psi of a whole coset but i think you get what i'm trying to do right um yeah because of the way it works like homomorphism um you can do this thing actually and so, and so, um, yeah, what was I actually going to say? Uh, right, so, so if you think about the quotient group uh, G by N, right, uh, it will be consisting of all of these cosets, right? So just, you know, N, G, 1, N, and, and so on. So it's like C1 could be this thing, C2 could be this thing. We don't know. So you could also have another homomorphism, call it psi dash, uh, which is going from which is going from G by N to the image of so in this case N is just the kernel essentially. So it should be the kernel of psi. So it's going from the kernel of psi. Uh, so I'm writing it as psi dash. Over here it should also be psi dash. Like if you're thinking of applying psi on a whole coset then that's essentially a different function now because your domain is now cosets and not the elements but yeah i think you get what i'm trying to do so just define this new function psi dash which is basically psi but for a coset right? so it's going from g uh, upon kernel of psi the quotient group which is the set of cosets to all these elements which is just the image of psi right um and so this thing is also a homomorphism, like you can see that. And this is like easy to understand, it's easy to prove and all that. Uh, so this is a group, this is a group, and this function is a homomorphism. And there's another nice property, which is that this homomorphism is injective, right? Because each coset gets mapped to uh, an individual thing. And it like if two are getting mapped to the same thing, then they are not different cosets, they are the same coset, right? Yeah, um, so so two uh, you know two cosets can get mapped to the same thing uh, only if you know only if uh, the the psi of the representative elements is actually so let's just call it g1 g2 and the cosets are g1 h sorry g1 n and g2 n so it this only happens if the if the psi of the uh, representative elements of the cosets, right, those are the same, but that kind of gives us that psi of g1 psi g2 inverse is equal to identity in H, which means that, so from here it's easy to say just psi g1 g2 inverse, that's the identity of H, but that means that g1 g2 inverse is in the kernel of psi, so that means that, you know, the g1 g2 inverse thing is in the normal subgroup that we found the quotient with right 
but that's exactly the requirement for uh, for two core sets to be uh, equal right because if this happens in that case um, you know you can take one core set and just keep multiplying by uh, g1 g2 so you just take one core set g2 and just keep multiplying each element by g1 g2 inverse we know that's just that this thing is just in the normal subgroup right yeah and, and we know that this is just essentially going to give us g1 n if you'd like think of it as proper multiplication uh, but since this thing is now in the normal subgroup right um, what you can do is you can also just you know um, rewrite this whole g1 g2 inverse g2 thing as g2 times n sub something i don't know n n1 called n1 n1 is just something in uh, in the normal subgroup and so then n1 n is just n itself like that's obvious and so it just gives us uh, g2 n essentially so then g2 n is equal to g1 n which is which is like saying that both the cosets are the same yeah so what i'm saying is that this homomorphism is injective now injective homomorphisms are given a nice term called isomorphism and so what we have just proved is something called i think it's called the first uh, isomorphism theorem and so what we have just proved is that there exists isomorphism psi uh, yes we call it psi dash previously now we're calling it psi you know what I just call it psi dash never mind that uh, so psi dash is is going from the g upon kernel of psi so for any any sort of uh, homomorphism phi sorry psi you can do this thing uh, g by kernel of psi to the image of psi so for all homomorphism uh, psi which go from g to some group h right so h is h is actually not involved in all of this only the image of psi is but yeah so you have to have some uh, codomain right um, and so when two groups so so these two groups over here for example have an isomorphism relation between them uh, we say that these two groups are isomorphic so we we denote that as g upon kernel of psi isomorphic to image of psi and we'll see in a bit what isomorphism really is but for now this is uh, what you like really need to know that for every homomorphism you can have the quotient group being essentially mapped to the image of the uh, homomorphism and this is called the first isomorphism theorem right uh, so for quotient groups uh, the homomorphism that we define it's it's called the natural uh, natural uh, homomorphism by a normal subgroup so you know so the so the homomorphism that we're essentially defining is that for any uh, so, so just have psi, which is going from G to uh, the coset, uh, all the cosets essentially, so just G by N. So this is defined as uh, psi of any element G in capital G, that's just equal to G N, right? So yeah, uh, for all G, G, if N is a normal subgroup. So this is uh, called a natural homomorphism by yes uh, it's a it's a very big name by a normal subgroup uh yes okay cool so we have discussed homomorphisms and uh the first isomorphism theorem so far all right so i'll see you guys in the next video